So today I would like to begin with a prayer for our sisters and brothers involved in the Israeli and Palestinian conflict and the place that we, the faithful, call the Holy Land. The Holy Land. I pray for your peace in troubled lands, in places where people fear each day, in cities, villages, communities under threat of danger. I pray for your presence, your peace, in the hearts of those who hate, in the mind of those who live in anger, of those who long for revenge. The hot wind of war sweep over so many lives, dear God, terror and cruelty following in their wake. I do not know what else to do, but stand here making my appeal to heaven. Peace, I pray. Peace against all the odds. Peace without compromise. Peace strong and enduring. Peace so children never worry as they go to sleep. As we gather here to promote a culture of life, recognizing the need for a Eucharistic way of reconciling love, we pray for peace in the Holy Land, and may we actively work for peace in all your land, which indeed is holy. Amen. We can... As we begin, I ask you to ponder a question. What is one way I, we, can better our relationship with God's creation? Pope Francis, through his pontificate, has constantly invited us to care for one another and for our common home. Eight years ago, Pope Francis wrote La Dauta Si, and his latest exhortation, as we mentioned, as was mentioned, La Dauta Deum, he challenges us to situate ourselves as human beings and evaluate our attachments and our understanding to what we call economic progress. He also challenges us to cultivate an, an authentic faith, a faith life, which gives us courage and transforms our goals and lives, becoming aware that we can burst forth a new way of living, a new way of loving, a new way of seeing. It has been done before by Pope, by St. Francis of Assisi and St. Clair. They themselves, 800 years ago, began to look around and inspired by the Holy Spirit, by the gospel, and their encounters with others and creation, began a life of seeing people differently, of living differently, of contemplating, looking with the eyes of God, and calling all creation a sibling. It is a call for reconciliation that we belong to one planet, our common home, and we are one human family. It is what we should have learned from the pandemic and when war, acts of violence, and depression, economic crises has come along that we all live in this intricate web together. And as we begin, I invite you to contemplate in an introduction, and I don't know if you're sitting with people who you know or are just now meeting, but I'd like to, you to introduce yourself not only by your name, but also to share where you come from in regards to the place, the landscape, 
the familiar sights and smells that you encountered growing up. We just heard Bishop Wax speak of Los Mártires de la Florida. They come from a place. They were here at a particular time, and that led through to their martyrdom. The same way that Francis and Claire were at a particular place, Assisi, they saw what was going on, and inspired by the Holy Spirit, acted differently. If you can introduce yourself to one another real quick, describing where you came from. I know that not everyone comes from this, this promised land of Pensacola. I myself come from New Mexico, from the land of enchantment, where the Rocky Mountains fade away, and where the fresh of cut of falfa intermingles with the smell of dairy cow manure. In the summer, the winds pick up, and the cornfields will tell you to hush. That is where I come from. Would anyone like to share their landscape story of where you come from? My dad used to say that, my dad was a dairy farmer, and, and I would often complain of his boots. And he would say, así es como huele el dinero. This is the way money smells. It is no wonder that I then myself became a friar, right? I don't want that smell on me. <laughs> Francis of Assisi, as I said, also was from a particular place and there were particular conditions in his life. He himself is what suffered what we would call post-traumatic stress today. He dreamed to be a grand knight, went off to fight the neighboring town. We don't know what happened. We might suspect in such a battle, he himself killed, witnessed, someone that was close to him die, but he became a failure to his father because he was a prisoner of war, captured and held for a year in a dark prison cell. And through that dark prison cell, he himself, his body became weak Messengers went out to tell his mother and have his mother then convince his dad to pay the ransom. Later on in life, Francis would walk through the Umbrian Valley, look for caves, seek that same darkness for some reason, for consolation. His environment, his conditions affected how he eventually began to relate to others. It was his remaining at times in discomfort that he then encountered God in strange and yet provoking ways in his life. Francis came to call anything and everything brother or sister. I just hosted friars from Poland and we were showing them the ministries we friars have in San Antonio with the migrant community and then in El Paso as our friar who was coming from, originally from Poland, is in Rome, he's the Secretary General for Mission Animation, and I was hosting him. I'm currently Province Secretary, and so the Provincial doesn't want to do it or doesn't have time to do it, I do it, right? And I do it gladly. But he at one point said, oh, let me pay for this. I don't want to be Brother Fly. 
because Francis would scold Brother Fly because Brother Fly would bother him while he was eating or while he was praying, and he would shush, shush Brother Fly. Francis did a lot better job than I did because I got into the hotel when to kind of hotel this, this evening and kind of to decompress. And as I was running through my PowerPoints, all of a sudden I felt something on my hand. And poor brother Spider did not have a good end of life, right? <laughs> I said, oh no. I said, what am I doing as a Franciscan? Why did I not pick it up and shush it somewhere else? But I quickly saw it and got scared and boom, sna slapped it off my hand. And then I was like, oh. but yet, what do we do as people of God when we encounter strange things or something differently? You know, is we often react. But Francis and Claire learned something that our blessed mother did to ponder, to ponder and then step into whatever that situation was. Pope Francis is looking through the lens of the founders of my community and is speaking to us today in saying, let us look at how Brother Francis, Sister Claire lived, not measuring progress through technological advances or through an economic rise, they themselves asked the church, can we live the gospel life? Will you, St. Clair, over and over and over asked for the privilege of poverty, sine proprio, meaning nothing belongs to me. And because nothing belongs to me, then all is gift. All is gift that is meant to be shared with others, even with Brother Fly, as I told my brother, don't worry. I said, this all comes from the same pocket anyways. But Francis had this deep encounter with the San Damiano cross, which we've been seeing, where he was told, don't you see, things are falling into ruin. Go and rebuild. Go and rebuild. Francis, Francis, don't you see that my church is falling into ruin? Go and rebuild. This was his, one of his first moments of conversion where he literally looked around and began to physically place brick by brick on these little chapels found in the periphery of Assisi, San Damiano, Our Lady of the Angels, Rivo Torto, the Crooked River, and it was yet in his third building that he realized, maybe I'm being called to something else, where he came to realize he was being called to become a spiritual architect, one who would look at living very different in a spiritual life that would be about befriending. Our church within the Catholic social thought has what I would say Francis went through, this seeing, this judging, and then acting, right? And this judging, I don't like that word, verdad? But it's like conocer, is to come to get to know in order to then be able to respond to the need the needs of our brothers and sisters, the need that requires perhaps us to bring about reconciliation as part of our theme. And reconciliation only happens when there is conversion. We must look and see 
How am I being called to act differently, to be differently, to perhaps see things differently? Francis engaged this process of seeing, judging, and acting, and then moving forward in a different way of being as we move forward to our next slide. <laughs> no, está bien. Francis had multiple encounters, and I don't want to go through all of them, but we ourselves can look at our own lives and say, what are encounters that have brought about a change in my way of living, in my way of being, in my way of loving, loving others or loving creation. Francis was taught by the church and his society to despise lepers. He would see one coming or perhaps even hear one coming and he would pinch his nose and walk away. But yet, on one occasion, out in the middle of the Umbrian Valley, something moved him. Something encouraged him. This past Saturday, I was at a presentation, and she spoke about the anonymous laity that brought about transformation in Francis's life. And she addressed the leper that he was or she was an anonymous laity that brought about a conversion in Francis's life. And yet, he's only known as the leper. So it made me ponder as I was getting ready for this conversation and this presentation is... What was in nature and in this valley that allowed Francis to step forward and embrace and kiss this anonymous lay person, this anonymous leper, a person he had been taught to run away from a person that he was taught to despise. Yet, he embraces, and in that embrace, he says, I experienced mercy. One of my favorite definitions of mercy is the willingness to enter into another, another's chaos. Are we willing to enter into the chaos of our common home? We usually run away from it, right? Hurricane Sally, we didn't want to stay around here. But what do we do and how are we being asked to enter into that chaos of another Francis also encountered Christ not only through the San Damiano cross and through the leper, but through the Eucharist and Scripture. So much so that he began to understand that the God that we often hear as all-powerful, almighty, is also one that is humble. The humility of God, that is what Francis sought to teach his brothers and sisters, those who followed him and continue to follow him. I believe that that is what Pope Francis is trying to teach us. Are we willing to bend low 
like our God. Sister Elia Dalio speaks of humility being the willingness to bend low. Because God, as Francis witnessed, chose to bend low in love and become incarnate. Jesus, in the institution of the Eucharist, willingly bends low in love and becomes a simple piece of bread and a drink of wine that we confess is divine, is the body and blood of Christ, a God that chooses to bend low in love is also inviting us then to bend low in love. And it goes back to Genesis that we have a God that has made us in image and likeness. The image is guaranteed, right? It's the likeness we struggle for. That requires conversion. That requires that we change our way of being, our way of relating. Francis invited the brothers because the brothers were quite curious as how he would pray when he would go off into creation, into these dark caverns, caverns, caves, and leave the brothers behind. They were curious, and Brother Leo was tasked to go be that brother fly, to go and, and as we say, you know, oh, the fly in the wall, to be there and see what is Francis doing. And in his prayer, he simply prayed, who are you, God, and who am I? Who are you, O God, and who am I? Now we might say, why would Francis ask such a question when he has already established or God has given him brothers, is already being declared holy and a saint? But yet, he never lost touch of what I would say is discernment of asking ourselves, who are we being called to be today? And who is that God that is calling us into this mandate, into a new mandate that perhaps we've ignored or we've been blinded by and haven't opened our eyes to that reality, but need to be open up to that reality that our common home needs us to nourish her now today and not simply seek to be nourished by her and to use her as an object that is full of unlimited resources. Francis came to discover God and his purpose through being present. Bishop concluded his time with, you know, in his conversation about remaining what does it mean to remain as a member of the vineyard even when there's discomfort, even when there are challenges, even when we're being tasked to live differently is how do we remain present? How do we befriend as the topics that we speak about this evening and tomorrow can become heated conversations? Is how can we befriend 
look with a loving gaze. Francis, in his own time, as our church was fighting crusades, was sending out crusades to the land that today is even at conflict, he chose to walk behind enemy lines and have a conversation with the Sultan. He himself, being a thoroughly Christian Catholic man, went into the Muslim world, engaged in conversation, engaged in dialogue, and came back to the friars. Different, admiring our brothers and sisters who pray five times a day, who gifted him a horn for a call of prayer, and he then tasked our brothers to call others to prayer. So much so that we today say that the church bells ring because of Francis and the early brothers. A call to prayer that he came to discover and learn from the other. Francis learned to be comfortable in his longing and then promote a spirit of belonging. Is Can we engage in such processes when we look at a culture of life to seek what can be good for our world for our coming home. I'm here on behalf of CRS, so I also want to engage in what CRS is doing. CRS was established in 1943 by our U.S. bishops after World War II to address the despairs of Europe. What war had done to society and to our earth. CRS has their campaign of one planet, one family. Here we have this fisherman, Benito from Bolivia. He holds in his fishing nets, his nets in his boat. No more sea to fish. What would we do if we were our brother Benito? Where would he get his livelihood from? Next we have, see the future of God's creation and our one human family must be secured. And so next we have Eulalio, 43 from San Antonio in Honduras. He's working at benches, watering vegetables through an irrigation system. Earlier on there, you, you saw where I come from, New Mexico, the land of enchantment. My grandfather was, would irrigate. He was a farmer, crop farm farm worker and he was all it was about irrigating and making water go through the acequias the ditches every summer my brother and I were called to go or forced to go or you have free time you go with grandpa and we were out there in the fields with him our hands were too small for the pipes that we would siphon use to siphon the um the water out of the acequias so that was the only time that we prayed with a football was because we would put a plastic football in there and then siphon the water so then the football would fly out. And my brother or I, whoever was not pushing the siphon, 
into the, the pipe, into the ditch, the acequia, would go and run and get the football to come back and put it in the next one. Because that's the only way that we could help my grandpa do this work. He later on would complain because as you look, if you remember, now it's, the crops are circular. Is no longer are the acequias being used and for the same reason of the use of water in New Mexico in a drought droughted area but my grandfather oh how he complained may he rest in peace how his work had changed he saw the technical advancements as laziness because now all I do is flip a switch I'm not out there working we ourselves felt we were rescued from the farm work until then we were sent to the dairy, but that was another, that's another, that's another mess. <laughs> I like that Aulelio, right, in Honduras, the way he speaks very much so in a process of conversion, how he said, they trusted me. They is CRS. They equipped me with what I could do in regards to my current situation by then giving his family drought resisting seeds and then by teaching them how to do an irrigation drip process. I'm sure it was tough for him to learn a new way of farming but that is one way that we are having to deal with the climate crisis today is that farmers, those who work in agriculture are forced to bring about a new way of planting, a new way of cropping. In Kenya, I was just talking to the same brother who said he was, I was in Kenya a few years ago with him. It was amazing to see that we friars were in this Reuri, 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 I was asking him for the name today, Reuri, and what was once farmland is desolate. What once was pens for livestock are empty. I only could see what was before. And in this village, as we were there for the celebration of the friars bringing enough friars there to become their own province, we had no water as well. <laughs> and this was, the minister general was there, we can say, right, the top of the order of Franciscans and ourselves were there. And so the friars wanted to do something different that day. And because there's two trucks that come with water, the first one came and the community of Reuri, the people, and the friar said, take that first to the minister. And the minister said, oh no, it goes to the community as it always does. We friars can wait. Minoritas, right, is again what Francis of Assisi was all about of recognizing that we were being called to be lesser brothers. Again, to bend low in love. You do that as parents, I'm sure, as grandparents, as people who have fallen in love with others. What we experience in these encounters, 
and in these relationships are what can then be extended to our lesser brothers who are seeing the effects of what is going on in Mother Earth today, but also that we ourselves can become advocates. And so I simply invite you to reflect as we conclude this evening, and I'm sure you'll be filled with many more questions later on tomorrow, and I'll be here tomorrow until about noon, but you know, what awakened an awareness in your life to begin to take notice of your interrelatedness with creation? What began? When did it awaken? Has it ever awakened? It's strange because one of my most earliest moments of land and creation was a moment of fear. And it, now as an adult, I reflect back on it often. It was during the Easter season, and we were at Bottomless Lakes, which is untrue because it's in New Mexico, but Bottomless Lakes, they said they weren't able to measure how far and deep the water went, and so that's how it got its name. But it's in this cave-like, and so we were down, or we were up on the top, and I was maybe three years old, searching for the little Easter eggs. And there was one near the corner, and I was running towards it. And my mother began to yell, because she just saw me running towards this canyon, right? And she yells, and I turn to look, and I slip as I'm trying to get the egg, as then I you know, I'm not looking where I'm going, but I see the egg that I was wanting to get break open and all this candy just fall into down and unknown and this fear came through me that in some way creation was quite dangerous if I wasn't paying attention. Are we paying attention to creation? Easter glory, right? <laughs> as we go there. And as I mentioned before, it's not just about what kind of friend I am to a particular person, but am I a friend to creation? Forgive me, Brother Spider. Thank you very much.